Hi, so welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be number four in a series where we'll be looking at the work of Friedrich Nietzsche, so a latter 19th century German thinker in the existential tradition, although it turns out that his placement among the existentialists is a little bit disputed, and we'll get into maybe some of the reasons for that today. Basically, today in this video, we have two main themes, the first of which has to do with a phrase that we've been using in a loose and approximate way throughout the previous videos, but today we're going to give it a little bit more specificity, and the phrase is the will to power. So that's going to be the first theme for us today, to look a little bit in a little bit more detail about what this will to power is, and then hopefully we'll see how things go. We'll get into the theme of laughter and dance and killing the spirit of gravity, and how it is that that too fits into Nietzsche's hermeneutic of suspicion, and moreover, the theme of overcoming. Okay, so let's uh, begin with the will to power. All right, so like I said, we've been using this uh, phrase in a kind of loose and approximate way, but now our task is to try to define it a little bit more strictly. So uh, the way to do that is to realize that when Nietzsche is talking about the will to power, he's not talking about will in the usual sense of the word, and he's not talking about power in the usual sense of the word either. Because at first, when you hear the will to power in kind of a straightforward way in English, uh, it sounds like, well, this sounds like a way of casting life in terms of might makes right, okay? And it turns out that it's actually quite a bit more subtle than that. All right, so uh, a lot of the work we have to do in the next, whatever, 10 or 15 minutes is going to have to do with sort of taking apart that intuitive and straightforward idea about what the will to power might be in order to reveal its deeper subtleties and latencies. So it's not about will in the usual sense of the word, and it's not about power in the usual sense of the word. So the way we've been describing it thus far is that it's Nietzsche's idea about what the motive force in life is. All right, so underneath everything else, what is driving life forward? And it's his way of grappling uh, with an answer, for an answer to that. So it's not, the mo fundamental motive force in, in human affairs is not going to be anything like a will to truth. It's not going to be anything like a will to pleasure or happiness, the way the British utilitarians thought about it, or the way Aristotle thought about it in terms of the eudaimonia as being the ultimate center of Aristotelian virtue. It's not going to be like that. It's not going to be like the will to meaning, for instance, as Viktor Frankl described it. Instead, it's going to be something for Nietzsche much more fundamental than all of those. So the will to truth, the will to pleasure, the will to happiness, the will to meaning are all going to be expressions of the more fundamental will to power. So uh, that's the first thing to know about it, I suppose. So, uh, when he speaks of the will to power, the first thing to realize is that, the, that he's using the word will not in the usual sense of volition or free will. Now, when existentialists typically uh, speak this way, uh, and when they're uh, waxing philosophical about uh, the meaning and centrality of choice and freedom and so on, they're usually uh, referring to that in terms of will the way we normally think about it, in terms of volition. All right, so uh, the way Nietzsche's talking about it is much more sympathetic with the way, say, Schopenhauer talks about will. Okay, so for Schopenhauer, or perhaps it's, uh, since maybe a lot of you haven't heard much about Schopenhauer, it's much more congruent with something like the Freudian unconscious. All right, so will in that sense, okay, so what does that mean? That means it's going to be something a lot more primordial and a lot more animalistic than the way we usually think about volition and our capacity to choose from the point of view of our being aware of our choices and, and, and so on. So um, it's going to be will in that much more animalistic and instinctual type sense and much less about will in its normal English sense. Okay, so, um, uh, 
Okay, so uh, this, by the way, this, by the way, is part of what makes Nietzsche's um, placement among the existentialists somewhat problematic, and it's sometimes disputed whether he really belongs within the category of existential thinking, because um, existentialists usually are are pretty quick to valorize uh, volition and free will and choice and that sort of thing. But what Nietzsche is saying is that volition is actually an expression of a more fundamental will to power. All right, so he's not one to say that, well, free will is the bedrock upon which all other human phenomena are based, like Sartre is more or less saying something like that. Okay, you know, so um, it's a little bit trickier than that for Sartre, but let's say for now, something like that. Uh, okay, so a little bit of uh, dispute about whether Nietzsche belongs among the existentialists due to the fact that he has this um, much more animalistic sense of what will is about in the will to power. Okay, so the second thing I said about the will to power is it's not power in the usual sense at all. And here we've more or less made mention of this in the previous videos in this series when I was talking about how pl power really plays out along the terrain of subjectivity first and foremost and only in a, in a derivative way uh, with respect to power the way you normally think about it. So power the way you normally think about it is probably in terms of things like uh, political power, military power, uh, financial power, you know, the power to uh, uh, send armies over to subjugate other people, or perhaps you think of power in terms of uh, the very act of subjugating other people. Well, it turns out that for Nietzsche, power is uh, something it includes all of that, but more importantly, it has to do with the real prerogative that masters have, which is the creation of new values and new forms of subjectivity. Okay, so power plays out first and foremost along the terrain of things like values, uh, modes of perception, uh, habitual ways of thinking, habitual ways of feeling. That's where power really plays out, because if you are able to get people thinking and feeling and valuing the way you want them to, you never have to invoke these cruder formations of power in the first place because they'll already be on the same page as you and doing what you want in the first place. So it's not will in the normal sense because it's something much more sort of primitive and animalistic than will the way we normally talk about. It's not power in the usual sense because power is mostly about our subjectivity and the workings of our subjectivity. So uh, hopefully we're taking apart this phrase in a way that uh, helps you understand a little bit about what Nietzsche means by the will to power. All right, so um, let's see. Let's take a look at your notes and make sure. Oh, here's something I wanted to mention. A little bit of vocabulary that was actually mentioned earlier in your notes. It's also mentioned at this point, too. Now, this is vocabulary that does not come from Nietzsche, but it comes from Michel Foucault. Okay, so who is Michel Foucault? Well, Michel Foucault was a later 20th century thinker, so roughly speaking about 100 years after Nietzsche, who... Uh, <laughs> took a look at Nietzsche's genealogical method and the hermeneutics of suspicion and ran with it with a freaking vengeance in the 20th century and became very famous <laughs> as a consequence, I would say. You know, so uh, Michel Foucault applies this historical genealogical method to a bunch of different phenomena, like he has a series of books on uh, sexuality and sexual deviancy, of uh, which he was rather... <laughs> I guess, infamous himself. Um, and he has one on uh, the prison system. He has one called uh, On Madness and the Conception of Madness, which, you know, by the way, psychologists are usually interested in that book, most of all, probably, of all Michel Foucault's works. But at any rate, okay, so um, that's not the main point. The main point is the vocabulary that Michel Foucault introduces, which I'm also including here in our treatment of Nietzsche because it's so damn handy. So uh, Michel talks about macrological formations of power as opposed to micrological formations of power. Okay, so macrological formations of power are the ones that I just got done mentioning, which have to do with things like political power and physical force and military force and financial force and so on. Micrological formations of power are the ones that play out 
within the terrain of subjectivity, and of course, most obviously, values for Nietzsche. Okay, although there are other elements of our subjectivity too, like how we think and feel and so on. All right, so uh, micrological power. So I wanted to introduce that too. So a, the, a way of saying what we just got done saying in light of this new vocabulary is that for Nietzsche, the will to play to power plays out mostly micrologically, okay, rather than primarily macrologically, although it does include the macrological dimension too. All right, uh, last sort of thing to note, to ride in parallel with your notes, is uh, that the will to power is always multilateral, okay? So it's never just a matter of power trying to exert itself in one particular direction. First of all, power for Nietzsche is also a matter of, excuse me, of counter power. By the way, this is true of Foucault too. But I don't want to get too caught up in Foucault because this is not a class on Foucault, okay? Uh, but it is a class on Friedrich Nietzsche. So um, what, is, what does that mean? That power is never just a matter of sort of unilateral uh, sort of vectorial direction, all right? So it's always a matter of resistance to that. So um, in fact, you can see the whole herme hermeneutics of suspicion uh, in precisely those sorts of terms, you know, that Nietzsche's product project in a way is not just to sort of unilaterally assert uh, you know his his particular way of seeing things on us but rather uh, to come into a kind of tension with the dominant and predominant way we have of seeing things so Nietzsche's entire project can be seen in terms of this particular dimension of power that power is all, all always a matter of counter power and moreover it's multilateral it's always operating across not just sort of one single dimension of power and then counter power but all other sort of vector forces come into play and push it around in all kinds of crazy weird terms that are hard to understand that's part of why life is so damn hard to understand because it's so complex a lot of the time. Well, what makes it complex? Well, you know, from a Nietzschean point of view, you know, all the vectors of power are constantly intersecting and, uh, you know, I guess deflecting off each other and so on in a particular way that multiplies the complexity. If only life were as simple as sort of power and then resistance to power, but it's hardly ever that simple. All right, let's see how we're doing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, because I think we have time in this video, uh, the theme of laughter and dance. So this is a theme that occurs relatively early in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So uh, Zarathustra, the sage-like character, comes down from the mountain after 10 years of more or less solitary, um, well, he has two animals with him, but uh, more or less solitary, um, what, seclusion. Uh, high up in the mountains. By the way, you know, you ought to pay attention when you're reading Thus Spoke Zarathustra to all of the over and under and higher and lower metaphors because they run throughout. All right, so he's uh, high up on the mountain and he comes to a low state. The two animals that I mentioned, one is the eagle, the animal that flies the highest and sees the farthest, and the other one is the snake, the, the one that is in the most intimate contact with the earth. So, you know, you gotta, you know, if you're gonna get much out of your reading of Zarathustra, you have to open the floodgates to your symbolic and metaphorical sensibility. If you're unable to do that, it's just gonna seem like a whole bunch of gobbledygook and you won't get anything out of it. You probably won't even read past 20 pages, you know, but if you can sort of open uh, the floodgates to your, your poetic and symbolic sensibility and sort of, uh, you know, trace the hidden lines and contours of uh, meaning and revelation as it flows across the symbolic terrain, then all of a sudden you're probably going to get a lot more out of it. At any rate, uh, Zarathustra comes down from the mountain and he informs us that he's here to teach us laughter and dance. Okay, so at first, you know, you think of Nietzsche probably, you know, your first impression of Nietzsche is these like very sort of like serious, thunderous type of uh, philosopher. Well, yeah, he is that at points. Um, but he's also like funny a lot of the time. If you have a particular sense of humor, let's put it that way. Um, he can be sarcastic and sort of uh, jokey like at certain points. And that's not necessarily a common attribute among 
philosophers to be sort of telling jokes, but uh, it is. I find him funny at points, let's put it that way, but uh, maybe I should give you an inroad into understanding my sense of humor, which can be pretty zany. Like, I think the funniest TV show ever was Futurama, personally. Like, to, to me, Futurama, far and away, like, uh, you know, outstrips Seinfeld and whatever, any other sort of funny TV show. So if you like Futurama, <laughs> maybe you'll like sort of the co comedic element of Nietzsche. So uh, Zarathustra is here to teach us uh, laughter and dance and uh, gay science, which is the type of uh, the title of a book by Nietzsche, and gay here means um, sort of happy, you know, the way we use that word in the 21st century is a little not, well, a little not like how Nietzsche uh, means it. So it, it's like like joyful science might be maybe a more accurate translation, but the title of the book is Gay Science, because that's the way Walter Kaufman translated it. Okay, so um, uh, another sort of marker of this early on in your readings uh, in the section entitled The Three Metamorphoses uh, within Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Well, okay, so the first metamorphosis of spirit has to do with the camel, okay? Um, the second one has to do with the lion, and the third one has to do with the child, who, uh, you know, which the child is the bearer of multiple symbolic meanings, but one of them has to do with laughter and dance and uh, insouciance and you know, being carefree and all of that kind of stuff. So, and I gave you yet another clue that, that Nietzsche often, fairly often, identifies himself with Dionysus, so the classical Greek god of antiquity, who was the god of uh, creative fertility, um, intoxication, okay, states of intoxication, and, uh, you know, celebration, that sort of thing. Uh, so there again, sort of this emphasis on playfulness, and here I'm going to give you a fancy vocabulary word that you could possibly trot out next time you're at a bar somewhere, I don't know, might possibly get you laid. See how much I care about you? And the word is ludic. Okay, so ludic, L-U-D-I-C, um, which means uh, referring to playfulness or states of play. Now, it comes to us by way of Latin. So the four principal parts of the verb ludera in Latin are ludo, ludera, luci, lucis, a um. Yes! Still got it. Third conjugation if you happen to study Latin. Okay, so a little bit of a departure from convention with respect to the perfect tenses, but other than that, fairly straightforward. Okay, so that's possibly a joke, possibly exemplifying the word ludic by being ludic myself. Um, uh, so ludic dimension of life. All right, so Nietzsche is always sort of big on the ludic dimension and telling jokes and laughter. Now, I said before we got into this that uh, part of the what, how you should understand this is uh, as a uh, element of Nietzsche's hermeneutic of suspicion and the will to overcoming. Okay, so like, well, how would that be? Well, um, because for Nietzsche, uh, the spirit of seriousness is something that we tend to value uh, without much good reason actually, when it comes down to it. Now, uh, maybe you as students, because most of you watching this are probably students, have gotten in touch with this somewhere along the way because um, a lot of the vocabulary we use within a academic context is more or less organized around this theme of seriousness. For instance, uh, if you're an academician like myself or a professor, you want to be regarded as a serious scholar capable of producing weighty works and my goodness, if you're really good at that, you know, they'll look up, start looking up words in the thesaurus to describe you and laud you. And one of the words they might look up is they'll say that your work is filled with an utter and abiding spirit of gravity, which means it's heavy and it's serious. And if they really like your work, what they'll do is, once again, they'll stop using English and they'll start using Latin. And the Latin word that they'll use is Gravitas. Oh, my goodness. I say, my good man, my good man, I find your work to be replete with an utter and abiding spirit of gravitas. 
with a trembling <laughs> of the voice and so on. And sort of like if you're following the arc of uh, the beginnings of a hermeneutic of suspicion with respect to this value, you might ask, well, why is there this fetishistic kind of fascination with seriousness and sort of linguistic markers of seriousness? And on the other hand, by the way, if you're in an academic environment, one of the darkest epithets you can possibly hurl at a fellow academician is to call his work or her work laughable. I find your work laughable. That's like worse than F-U or any other uh, four-letter type word, right? You know, so if you say someone's work is laughable. Or here's probably the darkest epithet in the academic les lexicon of insults. So get ready. This one actually is a four-letter word. Okay, strap yourself in, kids, because here it comes. Like, if you really want to insult your professor, say, I find your work to be a joke. Oh! <laughs> I am triggered. <laughs> I am so triggered. Someone called my work a joke and said it's laughable. Or you can combine them even, you know, like that sort of thing. Or it's like a light, like lightweight or something like that. You know, but if you call someone's work a joke, them's fighting words in the academic world. Okay, so, uh, well, why is that? Because I bet you know this as students, that sometimes you learn things best and you understand things best while you're laughing, right? That the spirit of seriousness is not what defines and organizes the entire life of mind for the human race. In fact, quite the contrary, that often enough, we understand things best while we're laughing, right? You know, like sometimes you really only get something when you can joke with it, right? I always thought I had the fantasy of like uh, maybe turning my tests into stand-up comedy performances, like following this principle that you only really understand things when you can joke with them. Right? If you can't yet joke with them, then you might be understanding them in a provisional way or kind of a okay way, but not really. Like when you can tell a funny joke with what you know, then you really know it. Okay, so I would have my students, instead of taking like a multiple choice type test or whatever, they'd get up and have to perform 10 minutes of stand-up comedy about Nietzsche's hermeneutic of suspicion, and you better be funny for a good grade. And uh, so if I say that to my classes, they're like, you know, like this look of horror, like, oh my God, you're not going to make me do stand-up comedy about Nietzsche. Well, why not? You know, because he's always valorizing the ludic dimension of life, so... Why not? And moreover, isn't it kind of strange when you think about it? Like, oh, by the way, uh, our evaluation of you students goes the same way. Like, we want serious students who take things seriously and write serious papers. And why? Why? And if you're a really good student, we might use the word gravitas to describe you. Um, okay. Uh, that's, uh, I studied classical Latin, so sometimes in English they say gravitas. But, you know, if you study Latin, you realize that that's a distortion. Okay, so um, anyhow, anyhow. All right, so, uh, okay, so here's how we can translate this in case uh, you haven't yet been along for the ride with regard to being an academician or being part of the academic world, like uh, bi biblical exegetics, okay? So Nietzsche is always sort of keen on focusing these hermeneutics of suspicion on Christian morality, which is to say our prevailing morality. So, uh, and here the critique, which by the way can be easily extrapolated to other religious traditions, might go something like this, like, well, have you ever noticed that uh, the definitive canonical word of God how few jokes it contains, you know, and isn't that strange because, you know, that the Word of God, so let's remember what God is. So God is the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent creator of life, the universe, and everything, uh, infinitely powerful. So you would think that if any being were capable of telling a really good joke, it would be God, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I suppose so. Like, omnipotence would include the power of humor, wouldn't it? Well, so then, why does the canonical Word of God, which is over 2,000 pages long, have hardly any jokes in it? And hardly any real funny ones, more to the point. You know, and uh, from, from Nietzsche's point of view, this hermeneutic suspicion, sort of the deficit of humor and the ludic dimension in the academic world, or in the religious world, or in our society more generally, is a marker of a kind of 
um, point of overcoming, let's say it that way, which is a relatively charitable way, that that may be where we might overcome ourselves to come into a deeper uh, set of values a, and a deeper relation to life in the process. Like uh, maybe your best moments are when you laugh as a human being. Maybe your best moments are, uh, you know, when you laugh, maybe not so much at God, but with God, you know, if you're religiously inclined, you know, so why shouldn't your, pr your prayer, your prayers contain some laughter every now and then? Well, you know, if you're having a really good time in the universe that he created for us, I don't know, maybe that would be a way of, uh, you know, sort of honoring God, you know, and being reverential toward God would be to laugh. Normally, we don't think that way. It's like, well, if someone's laughing, like, that can't be reverential at all. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, that might be a point to overcome something, like this kind of <sighs> preoccupation. <laughs> I'm trying to say it in a nice way, with uh, the spirit of seriousness. And hopefully, uh, I know I'm being a little bit jokey myself in this lecture, perhaps, because I sort of caught the Nietzschean bug a little bit as I'm talking about it. So, all right. So, uh, <laughs> Let's see, what else did I say about this? Um, okay, so here's a way of thinking about it. Like, uh, so this whole, whole hermeneutic of suspicion uh, invites us to take playfulness seriously. Or it might be inviting us to take seriousness playfully. Okay, a little bit hard to maybe tell those apart. Maybe it's a little bit of both, you know, but at any rate, it's asking us to pass beyond the outer horizon of this kind of, this weird fetish we have for seriousness and all things seriousness. Like, you know, it's, um, and this really speaks to me personally because, you know, I've had some experience in doing stand-up comedy. And uh, so, I, like, I care about humor and I think humor is a wonderful thing. And for me personally, at a personal level, not just sort of at a whatever, academic type level. And I think that, you know, wow, the academic world where I work really could, this really could be a red pill type moment, you know, I'd like to see deeper into reality than we typically do and deeper into the nature of our own project than we typically do. Maybe the least important part of what we are both as academicians and as human beings is that we're damn serious about things. Maybe that's the least important and least profound part of what we do. Okay, so uh, let's put an end to this video because I think the camera's about to turn off. And uh, so um, I hope you found it a little bit funny because if you did, you might be getting the point. Uh, perhaps a little bit provocative, hopefully funny and provocative at the same time. But in any case, I hope you have a great, wonderful, totally cool day. I'm looking out the window. It's another great, wonderful day here in Georgia, and I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're out there laughing and dancing and who knows, every now and then, killing the spirit of gravity. Take care.